Welcome back to a, another episode of Thinking Critically. Uh, today I am joined by Dr. Anna Zakrisen, who has five degrees in total. Uh, two of those degree, uh, degrees are coming from the Max, uh, Max Planck Institute, as well as Cambridge. And then she holds a PhD from Stockholm University in Marine Microbial Ecology. Uh, she de describes herself as a place positioned between systems to act as a link between scientists and non-scientists, academia and business, high school dropouts and professors. She's also the founder of her own consulting business in Green Roof Research, as well as the founder of the popular science communication brand, Dr. Anna's Imaginarium. Anna, thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah, it's, it's definitely my pleasure. Uh, the, the time difference between us is a little bit, is a little bit uh, stretched. So I'm doing this a little bit earlier than I'm a little bit earlier than I, I normally do these things, but it was, uh, it's absolutely wonderful to finally connect with you and to get you on. And as somebody who is a science person, obviously you have your own science communication brand. I was wondering if we could just go in a little bit to your actual science journey. So like, how were you, how did you come to find yourself in science? Whoa, um, that it, it's kind of a long story, but, but um, and a short story at the same time. Um, I think it's one of those classic things, like both of my parents were scientists, or, or rather one of them was a scientist and one is a medic, because I think we should separate that a bit. But um, my father, he took me out a walking in the forest, and he was a hydrologist, and he showed me how the glaciers, that we can see the, the tracks from the glaciers, basically, the, on, on, the, on the rocks in Sweden, and how the mountains were shaped and stuff like that. And, you know, I was taught at a very early age about um, biological things, uh, being in the mud, finding weird worms, and etc. etc. So, so I've always had a fascination for this. Um, having said that, I was also very fascinated by, by languages and with other, many other things. So, so it wasn't that, okay, it was my only interest and therefore I wanted to go into science. But it definitely was a, was a great foundation to, to have parents like that, that actually opens the door to you to show you this amazing world that we actually have around us that is not just human derived. Um, so, um, that was probably one of those lucky things that I think that I, uh, that I got. Um, but then I had some, uh, some thoughts of, uh, actually not becoming a scientist for a bit. Um, but then, um, yeah, life happened. Um, a lot of, a lot of things happened to me. And then at the end, I realized that, um, it is actually what, what I wanted to spend, spend my time on. So it, it wasn't a super straight journey, but, but I always had a, a solid interest in science. That's, uh, that's really interesting. You said that both of your parents are in science. So one of them is an actual scientist and the other, did you say, is a medical Me doctor? Medical, yeah, exactly. Medical doctor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so science, science was definitely strong within the family. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And they, yeah, and that they, uh, well, I think, I think, so I don't have scientist parents, but I can imagine if you had scientist parents, um, and I know that even though my parents weren't scientists, they encouraged me to go into science, but just being around that atmosphere all the time, it would be, almost be impossible, I think, to, do you have like intensely curious parents that they would want mm -hmm. to, you know, to bestow some of that upon uh, any of your children? So I think that that's awesome. But I'm, I'm super curious as to actually how you decided on biology then, well, that's actually what your PhD is, and maybe perhaps you so you study different things for your other degrees. But do you yeah. think were you more pulled towards biology within the sciences, or were there other areas of science that you found yourself fascinated with? Yeah, I mean, I mean the, th the thing is, other things are, are interesting, but there's nothing so interesting as you know this is just gooey, dirty biology. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's it's just it's just. Um, just seeing this life around you and just the, the amazement that this, th these things can, can exist and they exist around us all the time. I remember as a child, I could, I could be, uh, I was intensely fascinated by, uh, by my own skin cells on my hands. This sounds completely insane, but I could spend a lot of time just sitting there staring at me at, at my own hand or arms, just thinking that it was just amazing that these things worked, these little cells and they actually were put together to create a person and also it leaves uh, it's just it's just such an ordinary object and yet so 
incredibly intricate in how do you say it intricate uh, anyway intricate yeah yes that's <laughs> the word <laughs> and, and amazing so so um so i think that was probably the fascination of, of biology and of course i had other big questions that actually was one of the questions that actually led me to to my first degree and <laughs> why is bird shit white because come why on, is it white? Well, yeah, why is it white? Why isn't it brown like most other bird shit? And this question was actually led to an argument in a pub in England that then eventually led to me um, applying to Cambridge and actually kept getting in there. So, so you know, these weird things, um, the questions, the the curiosity that around just, just life, I think, is just uh, yeah, I, th I think probably led, led me on the path. But, but biology is basically what, I, what I'm absolutely most, most interested in, despite that there's a lot of chemistry and uh, the whiteness in bird shit. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you find? Did you actually do research in that? In bird droppings? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it has to do with, their, um, with the uh, renal system in birds, basically, that they, uh, they excrete completely different compounds than, than for example, animals living in, in water or or, or, or us, because um, we need to be able to pee it out. And they basically form a sort of a precipitate from their nitrogenous uh, waste products. So okay. they excrete it that way. And that turns out to be whitish in color. And uh, which is kind of the borderline between chemistry and biology. It's, it's just, uh, I think it's always like in those, where, where, where the topics and the subjects meet. It's, it's yeah. the most important, most interesting things, like white bird shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, that, that is a very good reason to go into biology. Uh, life is absolutely fascinating. And um, I mean, for a while, biology has always actually been a really favorite science of mine. And for a while, I actually considered going into medicine uh, because I'm fascinated by biology myself, but I'm not a huge fan of chemistry. And I'm sure that I could probably have forced myself to get through like the organic chemistry and the biochemistry if I absolutely <laughs> needed to do that. But uh, for whatever reason, out of all the different sciences out there, chemistry just never really clicked with me. Not that I couldn't do it, but I just didn't find it that interesting. Uh, which is, which again is crazy because like literally every other scientific discipline I am fascinated by, but chemistry just doesn't do it for me. <laughs> and I don't know yeah, why. Yeah, I, I, for me it's population genetics. I, I hate it. <laughs> I, can't, yeah. <laughs> I can't stand it. I can't stand it. I mean, they're, they're, but I mean, the, the outcomes are super interesting. But just, just the, I don't know, there's something about the way of thinking that just my brain just screams no. And uh, so, so I, I tend to avoid it as much as possible also during my studies, even though I have done courses on population genetics, which is, of course, why I realized I didn't like it. Um, but yeah, we, we all have these things. And this is why I'm so happy there are different types of people out there in the world with different fascinations. And then we can work together and complement each other. Yeah, so absolutely. You don't have I to mean, do so much boring things. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You can focus on the things that you're interested in. And if it doesn't happen to be population genetics, somebody else will fill that gap, right? Just yeah. like you know, I, I'm not interested in chemistry and there's plenty of other people who are, so they can fill that gap. Yeah, that's just that's how anything works. But uh, okay, so biology and then uh, your PhD research was in uh, uh, marine or microbial ecology. Yeah. Yeah, I'm exactly. just, I'm super interested to hear about that a little bit. Like what aspect, like what were you looking into for your, uh, for the research? Okay, so um, I was working on cyanobacteria, and cyanobacteria are pretty cool little um, organisms that can fix nitrogen from, from the air. Uh, so they basically bring huge amounts of nitrogen into um, marine systems and also um, uh, brackish systems or, or, or other freshwater systems. And uh, some of these uh, bacteria are um, toxic, hepatotoxic for humans. Some of them create these massive algal blooms that you can see, for example, in the Baltic Sea that I worked in, but also in a lot of freshwater bodies. There's huge problems with these blooms in uh, some of the Great Lakes and, and also in a lot of uh, like drinking water uh, deposits, in, for example, in Spain and such. So it's kind of important that we understand how these organisms uh, function, live and grow, etc., so that we can um, um, make sure they don't start growing too much. Uh, for example, uh, in the Baltic Sea and in many other areas, you have way too much phosphorus uh, compared to nitrogen. So the phosphorus nitrogen ratio is a bit wonky. And this basically uh, increased the um, 
prevalence of these these organisms and also uh, when the climate is heating it looks like they're basically becoming more prevalent uh, and um, yeah so that was basically what my PhD was about to to understand a few of the key organisms key cyanobacteria basically in the Baltic Sea and then I went on and did a, a sh short uh, postdoc on kind of a similar topic as well um, but then we were working on on uh, more lymphatic systems uh, like freshwater systems and and such. In short, that was it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's re that's really really interesting. So okay, so these <laughs> organisms, these cyanobacteria, and then you were looking at the nitrogen fixing, and in order to understand how it impacted the environment, or kind of just to understand the process in general. Uh, uh, both, because yeah. if you if you can see, for example, uh, that certain certain species are affected by by uh like for example their nitrogen fixing capacity uh goes down if you uh add more nitrogen to the water then uh you can basically uh, it can it can become an offset so um then it might not make sense to remove tons of nitrogen expensively from sewage because if that's being offset by just increasing the nitrogen uh, pr uh, uh, fixing capacity of these organisms, mm -hmm. how, how is that offset basically? So it, it's, it's all about like understanding the organisms, but also looking at the sort of greater ecological impact of them and also ensuring, which is something that's extremely important for me, every penny spent is spent as, efficient, most, as, as efficiently as, as possible so that we don't spend a lot of money cleaning up the wrong thing or focusing on the wrong stuff because in the end there is a finite budget for, mm -hmm. for cities and, and counties etc and we need to make sure that that money is used the most efficient way as possible and for that to be done we need to understand how these organisms work otherwise we just go on gut feelings and the blind faith and that is not a good way to to uh to do uh anything like this that has to do with uh environmental regulations etc yeah. so would you say that in like kind of the overall feeling for the research is to better understand these organisms in order to uh kind of to affect better policy. understand them what's that to affect, to affect policy in the yeah, right way to to affect poli environmental yeah. policy that's what yeah. i was getting at yeah exactly, exactly. okay yeah, so yeah. okay very good so to better understand the organisms to um affect environmental policy which yeah, of yeah. course we know is very very important yeah <laughs> so. i'm a very i'm very much an applied scientist i think i i, I worked in sort of basic research uh, for my for my diploma in germany at max planck i was working on uh like plant, plant genetics just really kind of uh looked at the phylogenetic shadowing and, and other other kind of projects in, in genetics um and it was kind of nice but it was like i felt it was like working with a crossword just it was satisfying when you solved something but then you know it was just a crossword at the end and i i didn't i couldn't see what what else could be done with this uh so so i know there's like a lot of different mentalities and scientists i have friends and they love these like solving the problems and the tasks and I'm more the kind of scientist, which is probably also why I work really well with the business side of things. Mm -hmm. um, I like to see the stuff implemented. I want to have a reason for doing stuff, like a, a direct effect, like real world effect that I will see within a few years time, you know, that kind of motivates me. And also, of course, like I'm super interested in the puzzles as well. Otherwise, you know, I would never have entered the world of science, but it's not this kind of the main thing for me, I think. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm kind of, a, ideologist as well I, I idealist i mean um that i i want to i want to see i want to see the stuff that i do implemented and change things but you know uh, both 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 people like both personalities are important you know you can't uh, like you can see that now with the corona crisis had basic research been found funded properly over the past like few years then you know we would have been much further in understanding coronaviruses and you know you never know what this basic research holds for the future and this is why it's so important that it's done and the work of those scientists who actually uh, spend their time doing that research is so extremely valuable and and uh yeah and then and another applied scientists more like more people like me um we're needed for just more direct action but different different people personalities and different outcomes i think yeah no definitely uh, mm -hmm. as far as personalities go i mean i can totally relate with the wanting to see what it is that you're doing actually 
affect society, like to go out and like see the change and not have it just kind of, you know, sit, sit in a journal somewhere and just be published. Mm. And, you know, you don't actually know what the time frame is for it to actually translate over to society, even though you learn something novel about the world that we never knew mm. before. Mm. Uh, I'm definitely, I find myself more as an applied scientist myself where I really, really enjoy seeing it in action. Uh, mm. where I don't have to wait decades to see the fruits of mm. all my hard work. Um, it's actually, it's really nice to see that. I mean, then, of course, some people don't mind that at all, where you know, they just, they do their work and then they publish. And that's, that's just kind of all that they care about. And there's nothing wrong with that, but uh, cause that's important work too. But yeah, I definitely can relate when it comes to the applied science and wanting to actually see it in the, in the real world. And speaking of business too, you had mentioned that, uh, do you have your own consulting business in the, you said in the, in the green roof industry? Yeah. Yeah. So I was curious as to how did you get involved with that? And how did you decide that you actually wanted to found your own consulting business essentially? Um, and in this particular space. Okay. Whoa. Uh, well, first I, you know, I hate when people, uh, particularly entrepreneurs, start saying things about, you know, oh, it's just hard work and it's just, uh, you know, me uh, just being so brilliant, pushing forward. No, it's often a, just a great deal of good luck and that you manage to find the right people that you're really happy to work with, you find the right type of clients. And, you know, I, I don't come from a rich background or, or, or had like masses of business contacts. It's, it's, business is almost like a, a bad word in my family. You know, if you're not in academia, it's like uh, you're not really fully worthy. Uh, so so <laughs> I had I had I knew nothing when I started. And um, then, of course, I did work extremely hard um, I started out with the science communication part because I knew Actually, leaving academia, going back to that first and explaining why I left academia, um, it was firstly, um, I was very unhappy in the academic world. I did not feel at home there. I felt like I was uh, stunted. I felt like there was things that I could not express and I could not be my, my full personality. Um, somehow there, it, we, we had a mismatch. You know, I know there's a lot of people loving that world. Uh, just for me personally, it was a mismatch. But I was so kind of like Stockholm syndrome of the system. And I was so like ingrained in me that, you know, leaving academia would be a failure. So I just kept hanging, clinging on there um, and thinking that, you know, uh, yeah, it just it's going to get better and, and et cetera. Um, but then uh, I got divorced and uh, I have a daughter as well. She's 12 now. And, you know, she was little back then. Um, and of course, like uh, being Swedish, and so we we shared 50% of the time. Uh, she's at mine, and then 50% as my ex-husband. But it still meant that you know any position that I applied for, I was still uh, seen as a full-time mom alone, which basically meant that um, I could say I just had to look at it realistically. I could say goodbye to anything like that. Um, then I, um, I also just looked at the statistics, um, here in Germany to ever achieve tenure and then to achieve tenure as a single mom, uh, it was just, it was just the likelihood of that was so low that I just figured, you know what, instead of just doing postdoc after postdoc after postdoc now, I, and then, and then enter the business world as a sort of a, a beginner, um, I'm going to leave now. And, uh, even though I have nothing, I have no money to fund the company or anything like that. I'm just going to start. I'm going to start small and I'm just going to see where it takes me. And luckily, um, that was the luck thing. Um, I managed to get a, uh, a grant from the, from the German government to basically fund, fund my, my, my company just uh, to basically pay my, pay my, uh, like being able to get myself food and pay my rent basically for about half, half a year. Okay. And, and that was enough. And then I had my second stroke of luck was just finding the right kind of people to work with. Um, I worked also a while at a charity uh, university hospital where I also worked with, with science communication and grant writing and stuff like that. And that was like kind of a, uh, a, a sort of springboard until the next step. But then I met um, a few really uh, key people uh, that I started to, to work with regarding the, the green infrastructure stuff. Because I found suddenly that, you know, I have uh, 
three degrees in plant science, basically, where I, I love plant physiology. It's this probably my most favorite topic. Uh, and I have my degrees in, um, in, uh, in aquatic research, where basically my focus was on, on nutrient cycles. And so I had the green part of the roof, and now we worked on the blue part and the nutrients part, the cycles on the roof, and then the soil biology and then the hydrology and that kind of engineering I could, I could pick up at the level that was sort of necessary. So, so I, it was kind of a perfect match. All these like weird degrees that I had put together over the course of the time turned out to be a, just a perfect fit for, for, this, for this, uh, this business. And um, if you'd asked me two years before that, I would never have thought in my wildest dreams that you know, I could find something that would be a perfect fit for me. But this is the thing, you know, if, if you just look a little bit around and you just think a little bit out of this cliched box, uh, Sometimes you find that, you know, uh, science degrees, it, no matter, you know, what you've studied, you know, there will be somewhere, somebody looking for exactly you. <laughs> because they, you come with a certain skill set that is uh, extremely unique. And, and to, to think about that uniqueness instead of thinking about your limitations, I think is a good, good thing to do. Um, but yeah, so that's basically how I ended up with, with the green infrastructure stuff. And uh, I do both research there, but also very much focus on the science communication part I, uh, around that. And also I work as a green lobbyist and, and change, um, I work for uh, changing policy basically in, in both Germany and EU. So. It's, yeah, that, that's a fascinating journey, um, <laughs> how you found yourself into. So, I mean, did you, did you have an idea then that you wanted to go into the green roof area? No, and nothing. No, like that's just no. kind of where you. That's just kind of where you ended up. And yeah, it's just uh, your, your skill up. set. Yeah. Your skill set wasn't very good fit for that. Yeah. And just, I, uh, I, okay, so I'm I'm a bit naive when it comes to green <laughs> roof. Is it um, so with green roofs? Is that essentially what it sounds like? Like like using grass on the roof or like solar panels or what exactly? Does, yeah. Okay. So um, so uh, that's a common that's a common confusion when people say here yeah, green roof. They often think about you know just green stuff in general. It could be like yeah. wind power or the, the solar panels. But what we think about is like uh, let's let's call it a living roof instead. That's another term. Living roof. Like okay. Roof. So it basically is a, uh, a. I mean, you you can you can see them a little bit here, there, and everywhere. As basically when you have plants on top of the roof. Uh, this can be anything from like having a garden with actual trees on the roof to like a, a layer that this thing with just some seedling plants on top of it. All of those are are like covered in this uh, in this uh, yeah terminology basically. So uh, what what our task has been is just basically making sure that we ungreenwash the industry um, because we want to make sure that we can provide um, proper data um and actually making sure that the green roofs are um installed uh and built and designed science-based um and and not just through hunches or this is how we've done it the past 30 years so we'll continue doing it this way but that we actually have the science and the data behind it and and we do a lot of um not me personally but um my colleagues do a lot of hydrologic modeling as well uh and um we built a lot of like online tools as well. And this is where all this like fun science communication to, comes in to play as well, to make sure that, you know, we don't serve this as just sort of an Excel table and send it out, but that is basically becomes uh, really, really nice online tools that are super easy to use that, you know, if you want to have the background infos there, but you, you don't get that thrown into your face. The first thing you do when you open it and stuff like that. So, and then and also we have uh, all these other uh, information campaigns around uh, that, that I organize as well um, around the topic. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's just been the most fun thing I've ever worked with. And uh, just to put a little bit in context why, why I, I care at all, um, it's basically about almost 60% of the world's population live in, in urban areas right now. And these areas are becoming very, very hot. So because of these urban heat island effects, they're called, uh, basically all the stone and asphalt heat up a lot and this excessive base pollution problems, and it also kills a shit ton of people every year. Like you, just particularly here in Berlin, when you have this like extremely large uh, crossings, uh, the people get so overheated when they walk across them, particularly people that are old or, or sick already. So it's a serious problem and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And, and also then we have the, uh, the stormwater issue 
that we have flooding. We have floodings at least three or four times a year outside of Maastricht last year. Uh, I've been like running down to the basement, getting all the shit up in my flat, and then you know trying to save it. And yeah. and uh, the thing is, like, if we can capture, if the roofs basically have uh, green infrastructure on them, is that, is that we we can capture a lot of that rain basically on the roofs already. So we basically intersect um uh the water before it even hits the streets so um this leads also to that uh the, the sewer systems in most western cities are completely under dimensioned and so basically in order to not let them overfill which basically means that your toilet suddenly starts blurbing out like brown water onto your uh, bathroom floor they have a built-in something called combined sewer overflows that basically overflows into your local water bodies and throughout the city and so when it rains too much in too short period of time, these things basically start overflowing straight into the rivers, lakes, etc. You can smell the shit in Berlin when it's raining too much. You can smell it in the Potomac River in Washington, oh DC. You can smell it in uh, Hudson in New York City. You can smell it everywhere. And what smells like shit is shit. So now um, think about like what kind of uh, diseases this can, can spread. Uh, it ruins the ecosystem around this, et cetera, et cetera. So it basically has a huge impact on the ecosystems around cities. Uh, and it can be prevented with the right kind of stormwater measure, measures. And uh, this is one way to do it. There are, there are several ways, but this is one way to do it. So um, this is basically why I think it's um, kind of worthwhile to, to study and making sure that we don't have the greenwashing, that uh, the decisions made are really thoroughly science-based and, and good. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I categorically agree about having the best available evidence in order to make decisions mm. from, because um, if, you're, if you're not deriving your decisions from evidence, um, mm. you're probably not gonna make the best decisions. But, no. uh, so when it comes to green roofs, so that's one aspect is uh, trapping water, right? So instead mm. of actually like building out larger sewer systems, or which retention is areas expensive. or whatever, yeah. which is yeah. yeah, which is very expensive. So what you could do mm -hmm. instead, you're saying, is then uh, put more greenage on roofs or make more green roofs, and mm -hmm. then this vegetation would capture more of the storm water. It ca it captures more of the uh, water on a sort of annual basis, but then in order to actually slow down the water to to become sort of a true stormwater uh, tool that is equivalent to sort of a bioretention pond or or a cistern or a tank. Mm -hmm. uh, you need uh, you need to tweak the green roof a little bit in, and add uh, detention capacities to that, and that can be done through, for example, blue green roofs or purple roofs or you know friction based kind of uh, roofs. So there are different ways ways to do that, but um, there's two two different um, processes. You have the retention of a roof. That's basically how much water. Uh, basically the plants can evapotranspire and the, and the soil can evapotranspire. It's basically the water that leaves the roof upwards as, as water vapor. It never hits the streets ever. But mm -hmm. then there's always like when the roof is full. So for example, if it's been raining several days in a row, the roof is full. So one drop in is one drop out. And this happens a lot. Like rainfall often comes in like batches. And or if you have like an extra large storm that basically fills up the entire roof. And for that, you need to have this like detention capacity in order to slow down the water, in order for it to actually work uh, as, as a stormwater tool and prevents combined sewer overflows. Uh, so, so those are two, two a little bit different systems. And um, uh, both are great. They just do a little bit of different things. Um, and, and the thing is like with, with detention systems, because they can replace tanks, um, they give a little bit better uh, economic incentive to actually build uh, a, a green roof or a living roof. Uh, take like the New York City, for example, we have a lot of like these huge tanks in the basements, like underneath the buildings, there are huge stormwater tanks, massive things. So now um, if, if just a few of those tanks can be removed or if all of them can be removed, that space created underneath the building can be used, you know, as parking space or fitness centers, or I don't, I don't care what they put in there, but that basically pays for the roof for the stormwater tool. And it basically gives a um, cooling and, and all this other positive benefits uh, from an ecological perspective of the green roof. Um, and I think this is kind of also what I, I, I am most interested in. Um, I'm interested also in the green finances because I recognize that 
in order to actually create a sustainable change and actually really properly implement some of the science that we find, we need to make sure that, and it has to do with the science communication as well, we need to make sure that firstly it's communicated well, but secondly uh, the economy is also being considered. Because if you don't give people a you know a return on investment or explain you know why they should do it, there are very few people to be honest, uh, and I was very guilty of this before. I was sitting there, why don't people just do this because it's better for the environment? But but if you have a very limited budget, uh, like why would you install a green roof? <laughs> like, you know, of course you wouldn't if you didn't have to. So so uh, it's important to find these uh, these arguments that basically shows people. This is how much you can save. This is how much you can, how much it costs, and and just do uh, not only an ecological budget but a, a financial budget as well. That's super fascinating what you said about the the green roofs and the actual the the economic incentive. And I I mean this is something that I was also guilty of as asking you know why don't we do these things because it would be the right thing to do. But if people don't have the right incentive or perhaps they you know, don't, can't actually afford to do these things because of economics, um, then, not, then nothing's going to change, right? Mm -hmm. This is why it's super, super important, and I categorically agree with you, is that any sort of changes that we want to make, it's, I think one of the best ways to do that is to create a market force. So for example, mm -hmm. with renewable energies, one of the reasons why renewables hasn't come online sooner, uh, sooner, like, on a wider scale is because it wasn't an economically viable option. And what I mean by that is that it was more expensive than fossil fuels. So people are looking at, you know, their budgets, balancing the books and whatnot. And, uh, you know, in capitalism, people try to maximize profits. So they're going to choose the option, the energy option that's going to do that for them. So if you cannot make uh, renewable energy or anything economically attractive or economically viable, then people aren't just going to, you're not going to get the adoption that you actually need or that you mm. want to see in order to make widespread change. So that's why it's so awesome now that with renewable energy, um, I think solar in particular, that if you look at the cost per kilowatt, kilowatt hour, it's actually below that of fossil fuels now. So that's it's like, nice, it's yeah. now an economic force where mm. people who are concerned, the, concerned about money, which is you know, practically everyone, everyone. <laughs> yeah, which is everyone, uh, that it's going to save you money by purchasing renewable energy uh, versus using fossil fuels. So mm. yeah, that's super important. Anyway, you talked about how, you know, your science communication brand and how that played into uh, what you were doing with the Green Roof Consulting. So I'm curious as to where exactly the founding, or the idea for Dr. Anna's Imaginarium came from. Like, was that something when you were in you know, before you graduated with your doctorate, you know, was that, that happened early on or like what point, what stage in your life did you like, Hey, I want to do science communication. And I realized that you said <laughs> that you're more like, you like the applied science. You like to see things in action. So I could, I could understand why you decided that you needed to found, uh, found it. Um, but I'm just curious as to the process, the journey that you went through in order to do that. Yes, yeah, so I'm sitting here debating if I should tell the truth or if I should tell <laughs> tell, you, tell you the nice story about, yes, that's exactly how it was. Uh, well, actually, it was born out of desperation. <laughs> I out of desperation, say. okay. Was, I basically, uh, I just, uh, it was just during my, my, my divorce as well. I, I, uh, I separated, I, I was, it wasn't my divorce, it was just separated from my, from my uh, husband that I'd worked with, uh, that lived with it for the past 10 years almost. Uh, I had my, my daughter and I had to go to Sweden because I lived in, in Berlin in Germany. I had to go to Sweden to do my PhD defense. Uh, I basically drove all the way up there, I had to sell my car. And then uh, basically it was not the kind of most optimal setup for, for a PhD defense. So uh, when everyone else is like trying to uh, lay low or take it easy and stuff like that, I basically, I went through uh, the nine circles of hell. I think it was just, I slept for, over three days before my PhD defense, I think I slept for like 10 hours and like total, I think, or something like that. And I had to, you know, deal with all of this. And, and then I didn't even know if I could go back straight to Germany afterwards uh, to see my daughter. And I didn't know what happened to my daughter. I, it was just a mess, right? And then at the end, it turned out that um, in order to get, because of course I had no job straight out of my PhD. Um, uh, so, so uh, yes, most people don't. 
uh, because I didn't want to sort of uh, stay too much in academia either. So I was still debating what I wanted to do. And, and you know, but at that time, you know, I would have taken anything, literally cleaning toilets, uh, wash, washing up anything. Um, that is, that guys is the real life of a, like when you, when you come out of your PhD. Well, I, I, pre I appreciate <laughs> the honesty. I mean, I, I appreciate the honesty here. So, so, um, because you, you basically come up from the academic system and most business, uh, places you just go like, yeah, so what's your experience? You're like, yeah, yeah. So I've been writing papers for the past years. They're like, and <laughs> like, you know, they don't give a crap. Uh, so, so there you are think like, you know, being like building yourself up for like years ago and like, yeah, I just got all this knowledge and stuff like that. And you just face people that just go like, yeah, but you have no working experience. I'm like, yeah, but I've been teaching for the past four years. They're like, nah. So, yeah, but, yeah so, no market, no market experience. Nothing, I mean, you'd no, be fine if you wanted to be a teacher, but anything outside of that, if you had no experience, nothing, they don't, yeah, nothing, they don't want you. Right? So uh, even teaching, it wasn't possible because you need to have a pedagogical uh, education for that two years line in Sweden and stuff like that. So I wasn't even allowed to teach. Nor I was allowed to teach university, but I wasn't allowed to teach schools, and I wasn't allowed to teach university anymore because I wasn't uh, employed by the university. You know, so that was kind of like also uh, messed up. So anyway, so I found myself that, you know, I had to get some unemployment money and I had to be stuck in Sweden for one month to wait for the papers until I could actually go back home to Germany, uh, where I could then, uh, that I had this uh, opportunity to take uh, unemployment money for three months. And during that month, I was so depressed and so sad <laughs> and felt so miserable, uh, despite my five degrees and incredible institutions that I'd been at. So I had to set like a, a schedule for myself to just get up in the morning uh, have my records go out to training and then I needed to have like some sort of intellectual task and that became Dr. Anna's Imaginarium so I basically started a Facebook page and that was the origin of that I just needed to somehow express myself and somehow just uh, force myself to just do something in order to not just like fall apart basically so yeah. so of course there was a reason for me to do it uh for that reason but of course you know i wouldn't have done it had i not had the interest because of course i was very interested in communicating science and and in the beginning it was probably terrible because i was still communicating like an academic like dry uninspiring and just like talking to my in group basically so yeah. it was just it was just um it was a good way for me to actually get real life experience because a facebook can be quite harsh because if you, oh if, my you goodness. If, you're, if, if you write something yeah. that's basically not in people's oh, yeah. space social media know? in general but facebook yeah when, when people have access to <laughs> long form uh long form responses which is it's, i mean twitter obviously is, is a nightmare when it comes to discussions but facebook Instagram's yeah. not not so bad, but Facebook is the best for long form discussions. People will just shred you if they don't exactly, like, and they, so they will mean. shred you bad. Yeah. And it, uh, I think I, I I got a very thick skin the first half a year or something like that. And of course, you know, my other business things started rolling and stuff like that. But I, I always kept this on the side, and then were, at times there were more more of that and less. But um, I've never uh, monetized it. I, I probably could have. I mean, I, I do give lectures as, as Dr. Anna's Imaginarium and I do I do, do things like that. But it's been a, a very critical business card for me as well for for other work that, I, that I've been doing. I was, I was also vice president of content marketing at a, at a, a medium sized biotech company for a few years. Um, and that I got partly because I have so much experience with social media and, and, and science communication. So, so, and, and I haven't just learned it academically as, as, you know, a marketing degree, but, you know, really, really fell flat on my face a fair few times and learned the hard way. You went to school, also, school of hard knocks. That's what yeah, you went yeah. School of hard knocks. <laughs> yeah. So but yeah, that's, so that, that's the true story of how it started. <laughs> It might not be the most uh, like perfect story, but that, that's the honest story. Well, you know, yeah, like I said before, I really, really appreciate the honesty. That uh, I mean, that's that's quite a journey um, from where you were to where you are today with uh, yeah. with the brand. And it sounds like it was a motivational tool for you, and maybe a bit of an antidepressant too, like to to take your skill set that you had and then to go out there and to interact with people. And I think it's really, really interesting that you said that the first year or so that you were doing it, uh, you weren't terribly successful at it because of the way that you were presenting information. Mm -hmm. I know, I mean, I've been at this for a couple of years now, and I know that sometimes mm -hmm. how I present the information 
like what, what, what I get the most likes for versus what I get less likes for is I get the most likes for like silly memes and things like mm-hmm. that. And, you know, maybe with a tidbit of truth in there, something science related versus kind of the more lengthy posts that I put together or these articles that I write that are definitely more instructive. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't get mm-hmm. as much feedback on them or, or as much positive feedback. I mean, I get some, I don't, I, I very rarely get negative feedback, but I can tell that, you know, it's not resonating as well. Like it's a bit dry, almost mm-hmm. too academic, I guess. But yeah, it's definitely a skill, right? Marketing is definitely a skill and then mm-hmm. being able to figure out how to get the information that you want to out to the average person um, mm-hmm. that takes work, particularly, I mean, you've been around scientists for a number of years. You're a scientist mm-hmm. yourself. You know how we can be. I mean, we're, we're introverted sometimes. Yes, yeah. and yeah, that, like <laughs> scientists can be on fucking, sorry, shouldn't swear, on it's fine. <laughs> peak mount stupid when it comes to the science of communication. They can be oh, so goodness. brilliant in their field. Yeah. And then you start talking communication with them like, no, we just give them facts and then they listen and then all is good. I'm like, but all data we have since like forever shows that that's not the case. So why is it so hard for you to accept that this is the case? And As a scientist, a you should be evidence-based. <laughs> it's like a massive yeah. Dunning-Kruger when it comes to, to marketing. And this is something that frustrates the hell out of me because I think that uh, if, if scientists, uh, I, know, I know a lot of scientists and particularly the skeptics and, and, and on, on, on social media, they, they often fall into this um, way of talking about uh, people as like, oh yeah, the, the stupids, they don't understand and why, why, do, why are they so stupid people, etc. And this is why I feel a bit like, yeah, but why don't you communicate better? If, if, if I mean, for, for communication to happen, it's often a kind of a, you know, you need to understand what, how to reach other people. And for that to happen, you need to actually see them. Uh, so, of course, there's a lot of nutcases on, on social media, but, but a lot of scientists, they can do a hell of a lot better job in communicating their, their findings. And I think also just to, to go back to this meme thing, um, I see it a little bit like when I give my daughter medicine. So I have to give her like, you know, a few, give her two gummy bears and then the medicine goes down. But if you just serve medicine the whole time, people just get tired and just shut that, shut, shut down. They don't want to see that on their social media. But if you just, if you just flood them with a few like happy, funny stuff, uh, and then you can serve like some more serious stuff in between and people will actually read it. I mean, I, I do a lot of technical and, and, and uh, SEO and, and, uh, and stuff like that as well. So of course I have a lot, many different types of metrics and how I, I measure success of things, but I've set up a, like for the clients I have, especially I've set up a quite solid uh, su- surveillance system and exactly you know what works and what doesn't. And this is something that I found really uh, clearly ups the clicks on, on, on articles is to post mix light stuff with some serious stuff. So you, yeah, you sandwich you sandwich in the more yeah. serious content with funny and light-hearted things, and yeah. then people are more likely. You found from the metrics then that people are more likely to click on the serious, the serious yeah. links. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, that ma- that makes perfect sense. So yeah, on the topic of inserting more light-hearted material when you communicate science, one of the things that strikes me as more or less being unique with you, because I I mean. I, I mean, I don't follow every science communicator on social media, but I see, uh, I see a lot of art. So you have this artistic side to you that you like to express with your audience. So I'm just curious, is this, have you always been interested? Have you always had this like artistic side to you? And at what point did you decide like, hey, I want to, you know, I'm doing all of the science stuff. I want to share the art that I'm really interested in. Perhaps could, you know, this could bring people from the art world more into the science and the science people into the art world. And that this could, you know, again, help with the uh, lighthearted material so that when I do feel, when I do share more of the serious scientific content that people will be more likely to click on it. So I'm curious as to. Yeah, I mean, uh-huh. I've, I've always had that in me, always. Um, yeah. And uh, which is also why, you know, I wasn't really quite sure in which direction I would go, what I would wanted to study and so on in the beginning. Um, but um, I, I've had, like, my, my, two, my two last uh, 
this is going to sound so weird. I just realized I was just about to say my two last husbands, and I realized that sounded really bad. <laughs> so I just mean I've only had I have one husband, and I had one an earlier. Uh, but both of them, I, I mean, I'm, I'm good friends with my ex-husband as well. But both, both of them are uh, very successful artists in their fields. Um, my, my ex-husband okay. is a uh, like a, a writer. He was Emmy no, nominated last year as well. So you know, he's, he's really good at, in his craft, basically. Um, and Joa, um, her son that I'm married to, um, now uh, he's, he's a fairly well-known opera singer. So, but we, we do um, we do things together, and and I feel a bit like it's not really that you know posting art and then posting science. Uh, it's more like using art as the language uh, to communicate the science. Because what what is in, what art can do is basically. Um, it can take, uh, it can communicate emotionally. So if you want to reach people's <laughs> like limbic systems, if you want to reach them really uh, deeply and emotionally on important topics, it can be, um, if you, for example, post something uh, on Facebook that basically says, uh, huge uh, um, spill of chemicals uh, killed uh, 20,000 kids. Uh, people would just go, oh, you know, very few would click on, on that. They would, they would see it and they would just maybe react or not, or just, just click it away, depending on the picture. If it's a disturbing picture, it would be even worse. Um, that is a very factual way of, of, of describing the situation, but uh, people shut down. People, people have defense system in themselves that basically makes them shut down. But there are ways uh, to through through music, um, through theater, through through other means where really really um, problematic uh, topics can be discussed and can open up a dialogue and reach people and actually kick them into action in a way that just the mere facts cannot. But what disturbs me often also is that you know I go to um, uh, more and more um, art things as well. Um, and that, you know, I, last year I was at an exhibition here in Berlin. I was not going to mention what it was, but I was just literally swearing from the first 30 seconds into it throughout the entire thing. And then when I got out, because it was a whole ex exhibition in one of the central uh, halls in Berlin. We basically had, you know, it was just about decay and biology. And, and it, the artists hadn't even bothered uh, learning the actual, what, what the actual processes were. So it was just some, you know, I don't know, some ego trip and then some, some stuff that stood there. And it had nothing to do with, you know, with real life and what actually it was claiming to, to represent. And I don't care if you okay. do something very, very, like just make something up, that's fine. But then you can't present it as sort of like, this is how decay works or something like that. And then it, I think it's, I think it's uh, unethical even. And so, so um, I think that, Science and arts, um, they, they, it's just, I think art can be the language that is used to, to talk about science. And we did, a, we did an actual an opera um, two years ago where it started with a scientific lecture, a um, little bit more of a kind of like performative lecture. So it wasn't just sort of like a dry PowerPoint and stuff like that, you know, but it was more like performative. But it started out with a scientific lecture and then we had the opera and then we actually had fakir elements because that's something that i work with a lot uh together with my husband um body suspensions um it's basically hooks through through the skin and like different um different fakir elements basically to um to elicit uh, responses in in people and, and try to not make it gory and, and shocking but weave it into the into the the stories and in, um, yeah, we had made microphones as well that basically took up the uh, sounds of the muscles contracting um, in, in uh, Joa's body when he was suspended up. And he was mm -hmm. basically singing a duet with the, own, uh, the sounds from his own body at the end. It was just pretty, pretty intense, but it was, uh, it, it was a great success, you know. It was an audience that was just not a single scientist probably, and there was just a gray-haired opera audience. And I was just like, oh my God, what did we just do? But you know, <laughs> we, got, we had standing ovations and really good uh, feedback from it. And, and yeah, so that was just one thing that, that we, we have done. Um, but it's important to me, and it's also important that, um, um, yeah, I think, I think it's just such, such, an, such a waste to not use uh, the, this combination. There's so many artists out there, there's so many scientists out there, and I don't understand why they live in separate worlds. It's just, uh, it's just crazy. Yeah, I, I mean, 
like you said, why do they live in separate worlds? I mean, I don't see the mm. science being mixed with the art too often. Um, mm. There's very few people, um, you being one of them, that attempts to do that. Uh, but it's it's nice because you have this more artistic side, performance mm. performance art and things that you can then blend very nicely with the science. And mm. so in your observation then, you have found that, so the art, really appeals to people's emotions and then you kind of sandwich the science in there as well and you feel yeah. do you feel as though you get like a more positive mm -hmm. response towards the science then when you combine yeah. it with art versus when you just present either by themselves perhaps or yeah. in particular science by itself so instead Absolutely. of you know instead of just presenting facts from the science side of it with the art you can you know you have something beautiful appeal it uh, appeals to the emotions of individuals and then you kind of sandwich facts in there yeah and, yeah. So, so really I, I had one, one. Uh, I, I, I've, I'm involved very much in sort of. Uh, I've been, I've been to a fair few um, like tattoo conventions and, and body suspension conventions, and you know, I've been talking about the biology of pain and, and the biology of yeah, like different type of like bodily functions that they might be interested in. And uh, I, I remember like the, the first one I went to, I had. Over a year and a half afterwards, I still had people writing to me asking about things like book tips and wanting to read more and wanting to learn more and stuff like that. And that's not something you get when you present at a science uh, com convention or like to, to your own kind of peer in group. It was just, it was like uh, people suddenly just like opening up their eyes to a different world, yeah. you know, and, and suddenly just realizing that they might have hated science in school because they had a bad teacher or they, you know, they've been taught that, you know, science is this or that, you know, uh, and they just uh, didn't, you know, it's presented extremely boringly in school sometimes. And, uh, and that could be, uh, you know, ruining things for, for people. But it was just like, it's, I think it's amazing to see people like just light up and then suddenly realize that, okay, this world is there and it's for me as well. And I can take part. I think that's nice. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's incredible because these are individuals who probably were never really that interested in science before. Mm. Then they experienced whatever sort of performance arts or, you know, encounter, encountered you at a convention. And then all of a sudden, because science has communicated the, to them in a way where it's interesting to what they're interested in, therefore, suddenly the world of science has opened up to them. And now they're, you know, they're going to explore more into science and then maybe not just the science that pertains to the whatever the convention was about but then perhaps then you know it'll pique their curiosity and then they'll explore more areas of science mm. then because of it so yeah i think i mean to me that that's awesome because again you are bringing people into science that have that have never really been in science before and I think it's important for for our democracy. <clears throat> I think it's a, cr a critical part for for a stable society and stable stable world, basically. Uh, 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 Uber is that uh, people start thinking not only science, but it's just it's more than just science. It's critical thinking. It's about questioning things, um, but not questioning things in a, in, a, in a stupid way. You know, yeah. it's like you get into denialism. But that that people actually start thinking properly critical about um, everyone has biases. Uh, we all uh, do make biased choices every day. But to train ourselves to become more and more aware of this, I think that is the the main ingredient for a, a stable uh, stable society and a stable democracy where people are not so easily lured into uh, populist ideologies and, and, and this, this insanity that we see around us right now. Um, so, so I think it's um, the role of the science communicator and the role of the, the skeptical, uh, like true skeptical communicator, not denialists or not like arrogant assholes um, <laughs> because there are a fair few of those as well. Um, yeah. I think uh, I think they or we um, have a very important role there, and I think we have an important task as well to make sure that the bit to, to multiply uh, ourselves to make more scientists aware of uh, how important their input is in this respect, and how uh, it's just simply not okay that they sit down and shut up and just think that this is for somebody else or, uh, or such. Because also the fact is that, you know, they are often publicly funded, so they, they should actually uh, give something back to society. 
as well. So um, I, I have quite quite strong opinions around that, but I think it's uh, it's uh, important. What we see around us now is just uh, it's scary, and uh, we need to speak up. No, I mean I I, I couldn't agree more, and I've uh, I've had a lot of people or the people that I've talked to thus far that I've had on uh, on on the show uh, and done podcasts with, many of them are exactly in the same boat as you and I, where it's more scientists need to get out there and talk about what it is that they're doing, that it almost should be a part of your job description at this point, because the scientists and their research is so detached from the average person, meaning that not that their research doesn't impact or won't have an impact on the average person, but the average person has no idea what the scientist is doing. And because of this, they don't trust them. They don't trust the scientists. And you have, uh, and you have people questioning, questioning decades old science, like for example, you know, anti-vaccines, anti-GMOs, um, the the global warming denialists, (laughs) but yeah. And the, oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, that, that is the most ridiculous one, but then, I mean, is it any more ridiculous than the flat earth movement? I I don't know. I mean, the, I don't know, but but it's it's, it's, it's even more interesting to think about what the societal movements that had to happen for, for this, for this, for, for this movement to become, to, to, to become what it is today. You know, what that, that is more interesting to look at. How, how did this happen? Be, was a be, complete complete failure in our education system or, or yeah, on our end yeah, yeah. to some degree because uh, traditionally what I think it is is that we don't really teach critical thinking in no. K through 12 like in in the public school system we don't teach critical thinking uh, what we do is we teach them how to memorize facts and then regurgitate mm-hmm. them on to an exam mm-hmm. and that doesn't really teach you how to be a, a critical thinker or a skeptic or however you want to phrase it mm-hmm. to question things and it doesn't mean mm-hmm. You no, know, you don't want to be a denialist where, or a contrarian where you just disagree with everything or you know, no amount of evidence is going to change your position, but you shouldn't just go out there and believe everything that you hear or see. Um, and also, so there's that coupled with the access to the, the entirety of human knowledge at your fingertips. I mean, you walk around with a smart device that has more computing power than they used to send astronauts to the moon in the 60s. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely remarkable. You have access to all of this information. And what do we do? We watch porn and cats. <laughs> yep. Yep. Pornography, pornography and kittens doing, I mean, the cat video. I mean, they're both wonderful, right? Okay. <laughs> Different but yeah, the, the kitten stuff. And to get into arguments with individuals mm. on social media. That we don't and, know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that we don't know. It's just, it's absolutely remarkable. And I think that there is so many great things about the internet, right? So many wonderful things about social media. But you have to acknowledge the darker sides to yeah. these technologies, essentially. Mm. Uh, and unfortunately, one of the downsides is that you have... I mean, diseased information can spread very easily. So the conspiracy theories, these people that are fringe individuals before um, access to the internet, and all of a sudden they can find other groups of community or other people online, and then they start to band together into these and groups. And they start growing. Because, and then they uh, start growing. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's it's great if it was a good thing, right? Because you want, I mean, if if... I mean, if you are a science communicator, you know, we can find each other online and we're out there promoting good things. So, I mean, that's a positive for society, but conversely, people that are promoting negative things then can as easily find themselves grouped together, band together, and then spread their negativity, their, their falsehoods, conspiracy mm. theories, et cetera, uh, far more easily. And mm. yeah, it's just... Uh, it, it's just a bit of a nightmare, unfortunately. And I think mm. that the pandemic has really, has really highlighted how bad it is. I mean, think about all the conspiracy theories that have gone around since the pandemic started. Uh, mm. So you had that pandemic documentary, you had those two doctors uh, from Bakersfield, California here in the United States that went viral, uh, promoting phony statistics or misrepresenting statistics, essentially. Yeah. Uh, it's just, I mean, Bill, poor Bill Gates. Oh my goodness. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Bill Gates, 5G, it's crazy. I don't know, what are your yeah. thoughts? How do, how do we fix it? What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I think, I think it's, uh, it's important to have the, the guts 
to to actually call people out on their bullshit and don't just go into like anti-vax sites and starting to sort of like attack them because you'd have like just this backfire effect it's just just uh, it's not gonna work it's not gonna have no, to happen no people close but off you can go them. there and see if you find something that appears to actually breaking the law just report it you know or if it's reporting report anything that seems to go against facebook standards report it just go straight away and if you see some like uh comments like that on on your page don't uh often don't even like if it's completely so far down the rabbit hole that just you know you develop a gut feeling from this after a while is it it's going to be worth responding or not if 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 you know this person is just so far gone just delete the comment and block because otherwise you just give those kind of comments uh basically algorithm juice so so that they're higher ranked on on uh, facebook and they they spread more and uh, the whole the whole algorithm is built that way you know they're like it is you know, yeah you, you, it's, 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 it's it's designed it's to keep you in a bubble yeah, yeah, it's an yeah, but it's an, an outrage algorithm because there are oh, there, okay. there are there are two things that basically uh, that people get enthusiastic about, and that is awe, you know, loving something, or it's uh, outrage, and it's very very easy to generate outrage in compared to awe. So uh, whole Facebook algorithm, all social media algorithms, they run on outrage, and if you give them outrage, that's exactly what's gonna basically shit ton of engagement, and that's exactly what the Facebook, uh, what, the, what the algorithm is, uh, is basically juicing up. So, so if you find comments that basically are really uh, down the, 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 the conspiracy drain, just, just delete, block, don't give them a platform. Because even though you might think that, okay, I'm just going to have my factual responses and I'm going to talk to the fence sitters, that's often not what happens. Because uh, a lot of people, they would go in there and see like somebody fighting the, the hard fight from below, you know, against the hard cold scientists sitting there with their facts. That's the story they see. Mm -hmm. So the story that you see is like, you know, I am the, I'm the sort of big knight here coming and serving my facts and people will see the reason of this. That is an entirely different story than what most people will see in this case. So uh, that's something that's very important to think about as well when you get involved in these things. Then people who actually ask honest questions, those are the people you should really focus on and, and spend your time replying to and answering uh, in, a, in, a, in a sort of good tone of voice. And of course, every so often we all lose it uh, and, and have arguments where we shouldn't because we're all human, but at least, you know, have the intent to, to work like this. I think it's important. And, uh, and other than that, you know, this is what you can do on social media. Call out your friends and family when they post, have the guts to call them out on bullshit because they will listen to you in a completely different way. You can have a completely different tone of voice to them. That's a completely different thing because you are already there in group. So you can speak with them in a completely different tone. Uh, now, the third thing is that, you know, go into politics, just support organizations that actually make a difference as well. Uh, why is Facebook allowed to, to do certain things? Why, why are they, you know, why, for example, is it that, you know, certain things are taken down like by the Facebook bot immediately, um, whereas uh, a lot of political hate speech can be just left there? Or there's a lot of uh, stuff on, on um, anti-science sites that are basically left up. that are basically clear out scams by con artists and that's left. And if you report it, you just get back the message, oh, it doesn't go against our community standards. Whereas like the min minor things uh, that uh, if you express criticism towards other things, um, I will not go into detail now, but uh, you basically uh, you're, you're bound immediately for 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 a number of days. Uh, so so maybe I think it's important also to to start um, not just thinking about the grassroots level, but also just to see like you know uh, can we change policy? Can we actually change things from the top? What is going on? Because there's so much control going on from the top as well. So I think there has to be some policy changes on on when it comes to social media. That, that are important um, for, for the sake of uh, stability and democracy, et cetera. So, so I think people, people should get more involved. They should dare to get more politically involved. They should dare to actually, yeah, get, talk, talk up, speak up properly. Absolutely. When you, mm -hmm. see, when you see something going haywire, make sure that uh, you can't just sit by idly and do nothing about it. No, 
And you know, I think it's interesting how you were talking about politics in there because you know, it's, it's really, really important as boring and as dry and full of, well, I not boring and dry, maybe that's not quite right because it just seems to be full of drama always, right? It's always people mm. bickering at each other. Uh, but it's incredibly important because these are the individuals who drive policy change. And, um, you know, even if, when, you know, don't, if you don't want to get involved with politics from a degree of like actually, you know, becoming a politician, uh, at least make sure that you're informed, make yeah. sure that you're informed about politics and go out and vote and exercise your right to vote and make yeah. sure that you're voting for people who mm. are evidence-based, who yeah. appreciate science and understand how important it is to fund mm. science mm. Uh, that may critically look at these social media platforms and say, hey, you know, mm. for the health of democracy, maybe maybe we should actually regulate these to a degree mm. uh, because it's quite evident that they can't be allowed to regulate themselves. So they don't self-regulate to a degree that is necessary in order to make sure that democracy is stable. And so I think it's really interesting what you said about politics because people generally avoid politics because it's so full of drama. I mean, it's just these people bickering back and forth and people don't know who to listen to because one person says one thing, then the other person calls the other person a liar because they, they say something completely different. So I think people are really, really confused, particularly in politics. And just in general these days, it's like, where do you go? Where do you go for ground truth? But even if you don't want to, on the political side, even if you don't want to get involved with politics to the, the, the degree of actually like saying, hey, like I want to become a politician, uh, at least inform yourself and learn about politics, learn about the different parties and what they, the different platforms that they represent and absolutely exercise your right to vote. I mean, it's, it's one of the most important things that you can yeah. do as a citizen of your country is to get out there and vote, to make sure that you're voting for politicians that, that acknowledge science, that are evidence-based, mm. that aren't just driven by emotions and doing whatever makes them feel good. I mean, we have a serious problem here in the United States right now with that, with our, the, the, the governing party. Yeah. And the, current, the current president doesn't yeah. seem to like science at all. And that's a serious, serious problem because as, yeah. we, as we talked about before, you, it's difficult to make the best decisions when they're not evidence-derived. So mm. you're just going off of instinct or uh, emotion, which is just, it's just not gonna, it's going to lead to inferior results. Mm. But anyway, yeah. I wanted to thank you so much again for coming on, Anna. And for those who are uh, listening to this, where exactly can they learn more about you? Um, find your plat your science communication platform, um, Dr. Anna's Imaginarium. Yep. Where would you Where would you send them? Okay, so my main uh, sort of outlet is on Facebook, and that is if you search for Dr. Anna's Imaginarium, uh, you land on my main uh, Facebook page. And I have a lot of auxiliary groups as well, but that's kind of the main page. Uh, I'm also on Twitter, but I'm not active. Uh, I never uh, found uh, found the love for Twitter because I like arguing, like long, long flowing argumentation. So it's, it became too hectic on Twitter. But I'm on, on Instagram as Anna Zakrisen. Uh, but I think if you search for Dr. Anna's Imaginarium, it pops up as well. Uh, then I'm also on Telegram. Uh, so I don't know, uh, we haven't mentioned this, uh, but I have a BDSM interest as well. So I have a Telegram channel where it's, um, if you're sensitive, do not join it. <laughs> it's, uh, so it's basically science and BDSM, which is kind of kind of my, my special type of brand. Um, and then my homepage. And then uh, the Green Roof research that we do is on Green Roof Diagnostics um, and, and Purple Dash Roof. Uh, so purple dash roof basically is basically I, I write the almost entire blog uh, on purple roof and it's uh, it's basically uh, yeah it's easy to, easy to digest articles on green infrastructure and stormwater management. Perfect, and all of that information as always will be included in the show notes. So for those of you who are watching, make sure to click on those links. And thank you for tuning in. It's been thank wonderful, you. Anna. Thank you as well. And until next time, everyone. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.